So now that we've introduced elimination reactions, let's go into a little bit more detail. And in this video, we're going to talk about something called Zaitsev's rule. It's going to help us predict what type of products we should see from a given elimination reaction. So before we actually talk about what Zaitsev's rule is, let's just make sure that we know exactly what's going on in this first elimination reaction that I've drawn here. So it helps just to make sure that we know what bonds are forming, what bonds are breaking, so we can analyze exactly what's happened. Okay, so having done the numbering and putting in the hidden or implicit hydrogens here, let's just see what bonds form, what bonds break. Carbon one, carbon one, nothing has changed. Carbon one looks exactly the same, so nothing's, nothing's different here. What's different about our starting material versus our product is carbon two to chlorine has broken. So we've broken carbon two to chlorine, and we've also formed a new pi bond between carbon two and carbon three. So carbon two to carbon three pi. We've also broken the carbon three to hydrogen bond, which is no longer present. It's now forming a pi bond with carbon two. So we broke carbon three to hydrogen. And finally, we had our OH minus, which is our base. Now it's formed a new bond to a proton. So we formed the OH. Now what's interesting here is that we have our leaving group. This is on carbon two. Our major product, and this is just from experiment. This is not something that, that we just threw out of a hat. This is from an experimental, experimental result. We just find that we do tend to, we have measured this as our major product. And we do have a small minor product as well. And the minor product looks like this. So we have CH2 and then we have this um, carbon and this carbon. And if you notice what's different about our minor product compared to our major product. So maybe we'll draw the hydrogens in here. So in our minor product, we've broken a bond from our C1 so our carbon, our carbon one has lost a hydrogen. We formed a double bond between carbon one and carbon two. And we draw the hydrogen in too. So this is our minor product. This is our major product. Okay, so this is just what experiment tells us. We'll go into exactly how and why this occurs in, in a bit. Let's just do another example to make sure that we're clear on this. So this bottom example, let's just number all the carbons here. One, two, three, four, and maybe call this carbon five and draw in CH3, CH3, and draw in the hydrogens, and another CH3. And, and then we can do the same thing on our product here, one, two, three, four, five. And again, I, I wouldn't be, I'm not here being too strict about IUPAC numbering, just, it's really just keeping track of things numbering here to, to make sure that we can see what's happening. Okay, so what's different about our product compared to our starting material. Well, carbon one and carbon five look exactly the same. Uh, however, carbon two, we broke carbon two to Cl and we formed a pi bond between carbon two to carbon three. And we also uh, broke a bond between carbon three and hydrogen, so carbon three to hydrogen. And we also formed a bond between our base, which is water, and carbon three to form H3O plus. So we formed OH, and maybe I'll do this in a slightly different color. Now there's also, this is, like I said, this is observed as the major product of this reaction. There is actually a minor product of this reaction, and the minor product looks like this. We could have carbon, hydrogen, hydrogen, attached to a CH3 and then attached to the two epo groups. And actually note that it doesn't matter. We could, we can remove, well, actually let's do it this way too. So we'll, we'll show the example. So C, H, H and CH3 and we form this product too. So notice that we could also have removed a proton from carbon one or carbon five and we get this. Now notice that actually these are the same. Uh, if we rotate this bond, we actually get this. So these are actually the same molecule. They're both two methyl um, one butene. So 
We could also, we could have our major product and we also have a little bit of our minor product. Minor product. So what do our major products have in common with each other and what do our minor products have in common with each other? Well, if we analyze the difference between our major and our minor product, let's just have a look. Let's note the major difference is that we have an alkene that's attached to one, two, three carbons and one hydrogen. So this is, let's just give ourselves a little bit of space here. This is a tri substituted alkene. And if we look at our minor product here, and maybe draw it out a little bit, a little bit neater form here. So if we were to draw our minor product out, it looks like this. And if we draw in the hydrogens. We notice how many carbons are attached directly to our alkene. Uh, so here we'd have one. And we don't count these carbons because they're not counted directly, attached directly to the alkene. So we have one, and then we have three hydrogens. So this is an example of a mono substituted alkene. So our tri substituted alkene is our major, and this is maybe about 80% in this reaction, and our mono substituted is our minor, maybe 20% of the component of our of our products here. Now what do what is the how does the major product of this reaction compare to the minor products of this of this reaction? So let's let's look at the bottom reaction here and, and again sort of analyze things. Well carbon two, carbon three, we have one, two, three carbons attached, CH3, three carbons attached to our alkene. So this again is a tri substituted alkene. And looking at our minor product, we have, it's attached to two hydrogens and two carbons. Of course, these are both the same molecule, two hydrogens, two carbons. So these are di-substituted. This is a di-substituted alkene. And again, this is our major product. Again, you know, roughly 80% and our di-substituted alkene or minor product, roughly 20%. This is just a, a rough estimate. So in both cases, we said that the tri-substituted alkene, here with tri-substituted was favored over mono-substituted, here tri-substituted was favored over di-substituted. So after seeing a number of these different elimination reactions, it was Zaitsev back in uh, the 1860s, um, could be the 1870s, observed that that the in elimination reactions we always form the more substituted alkene. Always form the more substituted alkene. And why is that? Why might that be? Why might we always form the more substituted alkene? Well the more carbons attached, actually let me redraw this a different way. Alkene stability increases with increasing substitution. And by substitution, we really mean carbon versus H. So as we replace hydrogens with carbons directly attached to the alkene, we're going to increase the stability of the alkene. And that's Zaitsev's rule. It applies for the elimination reactions. Uh, and this tells us how to expect what our major product of an elimination reaction is going to be. Always form the more substituted alkene. So in the next video, we'll go through an exercise and try and predict the major products of a number of different elimination reactions.